ഹിമ <laughs> ومن يؤتى الحكمة فقد أوتي خيرا كثيرا وما يذكر إلا أولو الألباب صدق الله العظيم When I was younger and I thought of people who were involved in giving da'wah when I went to conventions and saw speakers speaking in front of a room full of people or a hall full of people I always looked at them as superhuman beings. I thought that these people were born in sajda. When these people were born from their mother's wombs, they must have come out saying, Inni Abdullah, atani al-kitab, wa ja'alani nabiyya, wa ja'alani mubarakan aynama kuntu, wa awsani bis salati wa zakati ma dumtu hayya, the words of Isa alayhi salam and his birth. And my parents, Allah reward them, chose a path of studying Islam for me. And it's a path that I pursued, but as I pursued this pathway, as I moved forward, I kept thinking to myself, I'm not made to do what those people do. I always undersold myself. And I thought that the people who are out there passing out flyers and those people that are on radio and those people that are on the TV and they're representing Islam, this is big stuff. And I'm no one. How am I ever going to stand in a place like that? So... While I was studying in the UK, there was a particular holiday that came up and I came to America and I was in our small little Elizabethtown, Kentucky. In our town, until today, we still don't have a single Muslim halal restaurant or meat store. And our family was particular on eating the biha halal. So we would appoint someone every month to go to the next biggest city and they would drive this truck down there and fill it up with meat and bring it back. and it would be sometimes a 2 hour drive or sometimes a 3 hour drive wherever they found a good price so it was the imam's turn to make the long haul he said to me hussein you want to come along i was on break and i really didn't have much going on so i said sure so i joined along with him now when we were leaving the house i had a feeling the drive might get a little boring like you know what is the imam going to talk about that's cool So when I was leaving I pulled a, uh, one or two cassettes out of my drawer and I took them with me for those of you who remember these TDK cassettes they came in 60 minutes and 90 minutes so I picked up a cassette or two and I jammed it in my pocket and I got in the car we had some good conversation but it was a long drive and at some point the, we were just quiet so I pulled the cassette out of my pocket which had some Urdu poetry on there sung in a very beautiful voice and I jammed it into the cassette player The poet started reading the poetry and as he was reading it the imam who's driving he almost like spat at the wind, windshield and he slammed the brake and he he pressed the eject button on the cassette player and he pulled it out he threw the cassette in my pocket and said astaghfirullah I was kind of confused I didn't know what was going on so I said sheikh what happened he said to me Those words might be Islamic but that guy is knocking off a Bollywood song right there. So naturally I said what anyone would say. What is that guys? How do you know it's a Bollywood song? <laughs> And then he said one of the most profound things anyone's ever said to me in my life. And he probably doesn't remember what he said, but it stuck with me and I think of it quite regularly. He said to me, "Hussein, everyone has a past. Only the intelligent know when it's time to move forward." And this gave me hope. Because it taught me that someone like myself could one day stand in front of people and say with honor and pride, "Qala Allah, qala Ar-Rasul." That Allah said this and the messenger of Allah said this. And I realized that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala is Al-Hakim. 
He is truly wise. When you're going through your moments in life, you really don't know why it's happening because our thought is so narrow. Our ability to understand is so narrow. But when you look back retrospectively at your, uh, retrospectively at your life, all you see is the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you constant opportunities in your life to do something. And now it's up to you and I whether we make something of those opportunities or we just allow them to slip away, allow them to go away. As a student of history, when I read Islamic history in particular, I find that every region of this world was honored with the honor to serve this deen. Places in the world that you wouldn't imagine. And the greatest scholars came from there. These people served the deen in a very unique way. When I say the name of Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, everyone knows who he is. Many of us, like myself, may think that he was Arab, but he was the furthest from being an Arab. Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi's first tongue, his first language was not Arabic. He was someone that it was expected least from. We think of Salahuddin Ayyubi. Many of us again think Arab because in our mind we're thinking that it was the people that the Prophet Sallallahu came to and it was their generations that did the khidmah. And without doubt that these people were the ones who served the deen. There is no doubt on that at all. These were the people who are our forefathers. Allah said to us regarding them, فَإِنْ آمَنُوا بِمِثْلِ مَا آمَنْتُمْ بِهِ فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَوْا That those who come later, if their faith is equivalent to your faith, then they are guided. Allah made their faith the benchmark. So there is no doubt in that at all. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't limit the service of this deen and the propagation of this deen to the Arab. Rather, Allah opened it up to the Ajam as well. Look at the works of some of the greatest scholars in our history. There was a scholar, uh, he wrote a commentary on Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi's Mu'atta. The Mu'atta of Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi is one of the earlier collections of hadith and it's very authentic. According to some scholars, this is not an agreed upon opinion, but according to some scholars, it's actually as authentic, if not more authentic, than Sahih al-Bukhari. And there's a technical discussion there to have, but that's for another time. I'm just trying to sh uh, uh, you know, express the greatness of this book. The book is in one volume, depending on what print you buy, you might buy it in two volumes. There was a scholar who wrote a commentary on this book. And the commentary of this book consisted of 20 volumes. 20 volume book on the commentary of hadith of Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi, which was originally one volume. And each volume has 600 pages, when the original book only had 400 pages to it. There was a famous scholar from Makkah Mukarramah, Shaykh Alawi al-Maliki, rahimahullah. He said, I read this commentary. And after reading it, the, this person's mastery in the Arabic language, this person's mastery in the Maliki school of thought, Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi's legal positions, this really amazed me. And I told myself, I wanted to find the author and meet him. He said, I opened up the beginning of the book and I started reading the biography of the author after I read the whole book, after going through 20 volumes. And when I was reading through the biography of the author, I found a name written there, Sheikh Zakaria Kandahlavi al-Hindi. Al Hanafi, that this was written by a person by the name of Sheikh Zakaria Khan Dahlavi, who was from a small village in Kandala. He was Hindi, he was from India, and he was Hanafi, he was someone who practiced the Hanafi school of thought. And it blew his mind away that someone can write Arabic so beautifully, someone can teach and talk about a fiqh that wasn't the fiqh they practiced so eloquently with such detail. And I share all of these experiences to help us realize that through Islamic history, Allah used different people from different regions of the world. The places, the places where you expected it least from, because that's wisdom, that's the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans something, it comes with a uniqueness. There's style to it. You know, whoever thought that the, one of the greatest prophets of Allah, Musa alayhi salam, would grow up in the, in the house of the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Whoever thought that would happen? And for you to restrict Allah and think that that's impossible, that the men like Imam Bukhari and Imam Abu Hanifa and great men like Ibn al-Qayyim and all the other great scholars that came before cannot be born to our community is a fallacy in your understanding, your comprehension of who your Allah is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Qadir. But the heart has to desire it. You have to actually want it. You have to learn to dream it. Who sitting here has saw a dream? that I've traveled from one part of the world to another part of the country, you know, from north to south, east to west, talking to people proudly about Islam, sharing with them the message of Islam. Unfortunately, unfortunately, 
Rather than being proud of our Islam, we find Muslims being shy to speak of their Islam. We find Muslims who are afraid to talk about their faith, when pride should be there. You know, which religion can say they have such a complete religion like our religion? Don't we have a group of Sahaba who came before us who were proud over their religion, who are happy to be Muslims? I mean, there are so many incidents that are crossing my mind to cite and to further reinforce this statement, but I'll leave it there. We should be proud and use every opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us because I'm telling you, you never know who you'll inspire. My mother was a Hindu. Someone inspired her. Someone came to her and very openly had a very candid conversation about Islam to her. Her first exposure to Islam wasn't even a conversation. She says, I was traveling from one country to another. She was in her early 20s, and I had a stopover in Egypt, and I was connecting my flight, and as I was walking past, I saw some people praying salah in the airport. And I thought to myself, what kind of people are these people? Like, you know, everyone's, the airport is like Qiyamah. Everyone's running in all different directions, and these people are taking out time to pray. I'm indebted to those people. When I make dua in my tahajjud prayer, when I make dua for my family, when I make dua for my kids, those people that were praying salah in that airport, I cry and I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. I thank those people for making sajda in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not being apologetic. I thank those people for trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't imagine the sincerity they must have had. I can't imagine the sincerity they must have had. They're standing at an airport saying, Allahu Akbar, subhana rabbi al-ala to Allah. And then there's a lady that's walking past who sees them. And Islam enters into her heart. And Allah gives her children who are not able to stand in front of people and with honor and with pride, with joy and say, Qala Allah, Qala Rasul. You know, this life, this opportunity, it lies with us Muslims sitting here. I kid you not. You know, there was a time in the 90s where we had this massive influx of du'at and scholars visiting us from outside of America. You know, there was a constantly a scholar coming from Egypt and someone coming from India and someone coming from Somalia. And there were these great shiuch and scholars visiting us in America and they were assisting and helping and educating us, you know, and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we're all aware of recent events and incidents that have occurred in the past 20 years and how that's changed. Nobody's coming to your country for da'wah anymore. This responsibility is ours. This responsibility is on our shoulders. There was a great scholar from the subcontinent by the name of Sheikh Abul Hassan Ali and Nadwi Rahmatullahi Ali. One of the greatest scholars from Hind in India. You know, just to uh, express what kind of a scholar he was, he passed away in India, but his janazah prayer was led in Haram Makkah, Haram Medina on the 27th night of Ramadan. A man whose honor was accepted by the world. Such a great scholar. He traveled through the world and he, you know, he wrote his logs of his journeys. He has a, he has a book called Karwan Zindagi. It's in multiple volumes in the Urdu language. So towards the end of his life, one of the last journeys he made was to America. And he traveled the country. This was like a good 15, 20 years ago. And he was in Chicago. And there was an imam who hosted him at his house. And that imam shared this with me directly. He said, we were having dinner with Sheikh Abul Hassan inside the living room and we were talking and we were eating. And someone asked Sheikh that, what are your reflections after visiting America? And Sheikh Abul Hassan Ali and Nadwi rahmatullahi alayhi said, as a, student of history, as a student of history and a student of knowledge, I have studied history, I have studied humanities, their rise and their falls. And by the way, he's written books on these subjects in detail. He says, from my observation, what I've seen in America, it seems as if the time has come that the son of Islam will now set in the east and rise from the west. This land right here will be used for the khidmah of the deen. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use these people and use their children for the service of the deen. Changes will happen here. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us all to be a part of it. Opportunities are presented. We have to learn to make something out of these opportunities. Activism is at the core of our deen. Doing da'wah is at the core of our deen. You know, this isn't something new. Inviting people to Islam, every Muslim understands, it's a responsibility, it's a responsibility I carry, it's a responsibility you carry. But it's important to realize that there is a fine difference between pseudo-activism and actual activism. There is an illusion of activism that I'm involved in activism. People, they think that, you know what, I'm, I'm actually involved in da'wah because the definition of activism on a broader scope is so narrow. Actually, 
It's so broad. Anyone can be an activist. Anyone can be involved in da'wah. And in Islam, it's true. Yes, it is broad as well. Da'wah is a very broad word, and it's very inclusive. But in our deen, in our religion, in our Islam, there is a heavy emphasis on the method. The means and the ends are equally important. How it's done. Because if it's not done right, what was supposed to be for you ends up becoming against you. You know, as the Urdu poet, he says, and I'll just translate the line, he says, you know, he says to his friend, he says, e Rafiqi Safar, oh, companion of my journey, you know, where did the journey start off and where did it end? We were planning to go somewhere, but we ended up going somewhere else. In Islam, when we talk about da'wah and activism, it's an actual journey. True da'wah and activism is a result of a process. It's not necessarily just a result of an idea. That one day you feel that I want to do something and you start doing something and then it ends very quickly. It's a process. And it's a process that starts with you yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawm hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not give you change until you desire it. You have to learn to feel it. When I'm asked to speak in front of hifz schools, you know, sometimes I'm traveling and someone will say that, you know, we have a lot, little hifz class going on here and we'd like for you to address the students of the hifz school. And when I sit in front of the students, one of the, thing I, one of the first things I say is learn to dream. Learn to dream high. Have high hopes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What the world thinks and where their hopes are maybe here, your aspirations should be way above that. Imagine what kind of aspirations the Prophet Sallallahu had when he is granted the crown of prophethood. Just you know, a few weeks back, we took a group at the Qalam Institute, the seminary, we all went together, we took a group to, uh, for Umrah. And we climbed Ghara Hira, the mountain together, and we were sitting inside the cave. And we got out and I addressed the crowd along with Sheikh Abdul Nasir and Ustad Murphy. And when I was speaking to the students and the attendees for the Umrah group, I said to them that, I really am lost. This is where it started. He was sitting here trying to just focus on himself and Allah turned him into the center of the universe. This is where the last time in the world the Quran of prophethood would ever be delivered to this dunya. This is where this fire of peace and guidance, this, this is where the match was lit. And I reflect over that night, and the Prophet ﷺ must have been so confused and worried and concerned and shaking. And he goes back to his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, and he, it's as if he's telling her that I've just been granted nubuwa. I have to take Islam all the way to Baltimore somehow. And Khadija radiallahu anha, she could have said, it's not happening. That's how we are. You know, our expectations of Allah's mercy are so little. And Khadija radiallahu anha, she embraces him and says, it's as if she's saying to him, it's going to happen. And the Prophet Sallallahu sees that dream and he works towards it, he works towards it, and he works towards it. And the reality of the matter is, true da'wah, when it's sincere, the end result will always take birth. You may not live to see it. Ibrahim salam built the Kaaba, he didn't see millions of people flogging to the Kaaba. He was just sincere. He knew that what he had to do was for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So if I can say, you know, for those of us that are interested in real and true activism, and we're willing to see that dream, don't let anyone come and tell you because you don't wear hijab, you can't speak for Islam. That person believes that they have a monopoly over the deen, and I as a Muslim tell you, they do not have monopoly over this deen. No one has monopoly over this deen. You are an equal shareholder as I am. Every person that says, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah has one dhimma from Allah and the Rasul. There is no special dhimma to another person. Everyone's blood is safeguarded by this deen. Everyone's honor is safeguarded by this deen. You can do it, you just have to learn to trust yourself. And when you do decide to take on this journey, know that true activism is a result of a process. It starts with seeking ilm, finding a mentor, a teacher, studying with them. In a time that we live in, even if the teachers are not available in your city, the truth is you can find classes online. That excuse that I don't have access to teachers anymore is not true, it doesn't apply anymore. There's so much out there, you just have to have a desire for it. The second thing, true da'wah is a result of your personal tarbiyah. People will see in you what you have in your heart. If you don't believe, if you don't live, if your heart doesn't carry what you're saying, your words will fall on their ears and then fall on the ground. But if what you're saying is embedded in your heart, it'll pierce from one heart into the next, 
And by Allah, watch the changes you'll see. Live the Islam. Live your deen. As Allama Iqbal said, Husn kirdar se noor mujassam ho ja ki iblis bhi tujhe dekhe to musalman ho jaye. That embody in yourself the life of good character. Husn kirdar se noor mujassam ho ja. Embody in yourself the light of good character. Ki iblis bhi tujhe dekhe to musalman ho jaye. That even if the devil himself were to see you, he'd desire to become a Muslim as well. True activism and true dawah is a result of your tazkiyah, your spirituality. Our Shaykh used to say, the effort put in the hours of the night making dua of Allah will be what delivers your results during the day. The results in the day are dependent on the efforts made during the night. Your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third thing, mujahada, sabr, ikhlas. I'm going to pair them all together, which means you are sincere, you are patient, and you're continuously striving. You know, this is a bumpy road, my friends. You'll have five conversations out of which two people will, amaze, will be amazed and they will enjoy your conversation because what you're saying is something that relates to them. And there will be that third person who will view you as a jerk and they'll be really angry at you and they'll probably cuss you out. But that shouldn't stop you because you're not doing it for them. You're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I pray and I make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ahdina wa ahdibina wa ja'alna sababan liman ihtada ya rabbal alameen. Oh Allah, we raise our hands in front of you and we ask that you guide us. Ya Allah, guide our children. Ya Allah, guide our communities. Ya Allah, guide this land and the people who live within it. The hearts are pure. The ears are willing to listen. The text is there. The example is there. The practicality is unmatched and unrivaled. The only thing is we have to pick up these pieces and put them together and to sit back and watch the show. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.